You know how when you have a party, you tidy up your house? Yes. Yeah, right? Same. The laundry that needs folding is no longer on the couch. It's stuffed in a drawer or... In the oven. You've got new glasses. I did. Do you like them? I, I'm getting... I'm not sure. I think so. Okay. Different prescription or just different frames? Both. Both. Huh. Um, so I today usually... Well, I'm starting the new year. Happy New Year, by the way. Oh, yeah, it's a new year, isn't it? It is a new year. Yeah. How okay, um, that driving me crazy? Yeah. <laughs> no, it has to be quick. You know, there are some disadvantages to being a Virgo. It's just, there's, you know, it's a thing. It, yes. So my new prescription. New prescription. I'm trying to do a lot of my administration slash telemedicine stuff on Wednesday mornings now. Um, and the glasses have that anti-glare protective stuff. Yeah. So, um, Wednesdays are going to be my glasses day, I think. So, yeah. Well, when you're like all of my glasses, like I took the rims off of them Yeah. and they all have anti-glare because every time, oh, there's the case for them. Um, uh, they all have anti-glare because we're always being videotaped somehow sometime yes. so, so talk to me how's the clinic how are the new progressions oh my god I'm so excited it's like so today is sign day yes so the by next week next Tuesday or Wednesday the server goes in once the server is in we'll have phones um but today the signs went on and so the signs on the front door say, Dr. McMakin's chiropractic FSM clinic, frequency specific microcurrent training center, treatment room one, treatment room two, video room, open shooting, the door sign on my door says, Dr. Carol, private or welcome, right? So if I've got company, mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. I saw a patient today who came from California and I started, so her history include her complaint is pelvic pain that's been treated with dry, ne dry needling and manual muscle work. And um, I started with uh, um, vestibular exam she has a history of three head injuries she's an 81 and 10 of course you have pelvic pain your ham have you felt your hamstrings has anyone ever done your reflexes she's hyper reflexic with crossing on both sides they always do my reflexes did anybody tell you they were abnormal and she's seen some of the best therapists around. So it, the thing in your neck from the three times you've fainted because of low blood pressure, the thing in your neck is why the thing in your pelvis isn't healing. And do you have trouble reading? Yeah, I just get really tired. My neck gets tight and they tell me it's just my posture uh no so it's what we do we don't just treat the owie mm -hmm. she's had some of the best therapists in the country treating the owie yeah and for a year and in our world if it's not 50 percent better in three to six weeks you're doing the wrong thing and they keep doing the same thing every week for a year and I started with a vestibular and her ears are fine Weber's sent it, both ears but when you do the fields of gaze she really doesn't like it when you go to the left they don't bounce too much right but and then when you go up and down your eyes should go straight and they don't, they zigzag mm. on both eyes. It's like, hmm, has anybody ever mentioned this? Yeah, 
So, and that's why it's a clinic and training center. Because right. once we get the cameras in, we'll probably won't have a full opening until March. But once we get the cameras into the video room, that'll be the new patient exam room. And I would have had all of that on video. And so it's a, it's a new year. I'm really excited. It's going to be so cool. And it really is um, long overdue. It's one of those things like you're welcome and I'm sorry. Like, know. you know, it's um, because that's when all the real learning takes place, right? The courses are great. The advanced is great. But it's watching it all unfold where that's what blows your hair back and that's what excites you and you can put it together and you can call your patients up from a year ago and be like, I know how to fix you now. You have to come back. Or at least I know what I missed. For sure. So I have no idea if I'm going to fix. She's got one sore spot left and it's right up by her tailbone. But the original injury, she was hiking seven miles. She went on a seven mile hike and she's you hike, you trail run, right? Mm -hmm. And she stepped up on a rock well, that was that took her knee past 90 degrees. So it was a big pull on her hamstrings and the pelvic floor muscles and the SI joint. Yeah. And it that was two years ago, 2019. So yeah, that's the injury. But if it was just tendonitis, which is what she has, right? She partial thickness tear of hamstring and obturator in the pelvic floor muscles, right? Duh. Well, that's what everybody's been treating. And if that was all it was, it would have been better right. by now. Right. So that's the reason that this is going to be a training center is to teach people how to think and the only thing I can think of, it's not how to think it's you start with the same physical exam every time mm -hmm. reflexes uh, my bad I didn't do sensation because she had her leggings on and a full-length t-shirt on and then by the time I got her undressed all I wanted to do is and once I found that her adductors and her hamstrings were like guitar strings doing her sensation completely fell out of my brain. So I'll do that tomorrow right. for four days. But the, you always do the same thing kind of based on the history. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that was my day. <laughs> it's a good day. Yeah. I think, I think that's the hardest part for me is to not rush some of those basic things because I know where I have to go. I know where I want to go, but you have to go back to the basics every time. It'll never steer you wrong, right? It, and every time the, the real thing is every time I don't do that, I get, I get nailed. I never get away with it. It just, it, and, and it's like, oh, what were, what were your, hmm, what were your reflexes? What were your, what was the sensation? So patient, so practitioners will send me these cases and they have this and they have that. And it's like, what are the reflexes? What are the sensation? Oh, what's the sensory exam? Oh, I didn't do that. It's like, you know, we can't have this conversation. Right. What was the vestibular exam? She has neck pain. What's the vestibular exam? What are reflexes? What are sensation? Yeah. What's the tone in her adductors and her hamstrings? What? Right. That got to do with her neck. Right. So those sorts of gaps and those sorts of questions are what tell me, us, you and me both, what we're missing mm -hmm. in the training. Yeah. What does her neck have to do with her hamstrings and her butt? Well, duh. And if yeah. it's not a duh, it's because that's on me. Right. Yeah. And now me too. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So that's, that reminds me. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> 
there's a few questions that um, I definitely want to get to. And I was going to, I wanted to open up with um, like some New Year's resolution things, but I want to actually go to this question before it falls out of my brain for, before we forget to have time to do it. It was a Facebook question that was also emailed to the two of us. I'm not sure if you had a chance to read it. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to read it as it came without making any facial expressions. Okay. Okay, here we go. Whoa. <laughs> it starts off. My elderly female patient had an elbow internal fixation after a fall and fracture about three months ago. She is now two weeks post-op to get the scar tissue in her elbow stretched out so she can fully extend it. I started with soft tissue and wound healing, which helped greatly with pain, but the scar tissue is setting in again as she is once again having diminished range of motion in the elbow. Is it okay to work on scar tissue in this instant with someone who is not six weeks post-op? I think it is, but I don't want to harm. You first. Okay. Okay. I, I didn't do so well with the don't make faces part. So it's a good thing I had to read this because yeah. I had to read it a couple times. So even though the fall was three months ago, the internal fixation surgery is only two weeks old. So why wait, her elbow was fractured three months ago and they, I thought they did this internal fixation at the time of the fracture and the surgery two weeks ago was to remove the scar tissue. This is why I had to read it a thousand times because um, we have an ORIF, right? The um, open reduction internal fixation is when you surgically go in to stabilize the bone. Why would you wait three months to do that after a fracture? I don't know. Okay. So the way I'm reading it, the internal fixation after a fallen fracture about three months ago, she is now two weeks post sedated procedure. Oh, wait a minute. She is now two weeks post sedated procedure to get the scar tissue in her elbow stretched out. Perhaps the surgery was right after for three months. There you go. That makes sense. Right. It was just kind of written funny. Okay. So I am hoping that the fracture, initial injury, and internal fixation procedure was three months ago. And now she had another procedure, perhaps, to get scar tissue in her elbow stretched out. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to insert my ugly face again, because I have a big problem with these sedated procedures like frozen shoulder to rip apart scar tissue. Yeah. Yeah especially in an elderly patient. Yeah. So the question is, she believes the scar tissue is setting in again. And once again, is having diminished range of motion. So this procedure is only two weeks old. It can't. No, it's I, the place I would go. It's number one, the scar tissue was probably not the problem. Number two, when they go in and stretch, cut, that's okay. So I'm going to guess that the diminished range of motion is not a 13 or scarring problem. It's a 124 problem yes. and a 40 and 396 problem. Right. And 40 and 396 is where I was going to go first mm -hmm. because... Two weeks, two, nothing is setting in to restrict range of motion in two weeks for scarring. Yep. Inflammation, yes. Torn and broken, yes. But nothing is scarred to restrict range of motion in two weeks. Exactly. Right? Yep. Okay. Yep. No. And that's, and it's what the question demonstrates is number one, the practitioner has a really good grasp of when do I use 13? And I'm really glad you asked. You get extra points, piece of chocolate for that. Yeah. And then it's a continuation of the conversation we had a couple of weeks ago about stages of healing. And it also may be some mileage with what these surgeries mean and what they do, and then how the body 
how to think about how the body reacts to them. Right. So when you go in and stretch scar tissue, what that means is they go in with a blunt probe or a dull scalpel, basically, or a scalpel, and they cut the connective tissue that attaches at the elbow. And I'm assuming, was it medial or lateral? Does she say? Doesn't say it. I'm just trying to reread it, reread it again. But correct me if I'm wrong, even if the initial procedure and injury was three months ago, that to me even yeah. seems really short to have restrictive scar tissue build up in that time frame. No, no. Not in three months? Yeah. Uh-uh. Okay. No, it's it, the any time after six weeks. So no, the, the challenge is the torn and broken part of it. And the, the muscles restrict motion when the tendons are torn and the muscles restrict motion when the nerves are traumatized. Right. So um, yeah, I'm going with 120. Thank you for asking. You get extra points for that. And the educational part of this is understanding what the procedure is. So look it up. Dr. Google is a big help here. So look it up on Dr. Google and what they're doing in this procedure. And then look up the anatomy. If, if it's on the medial side, you've got the ulnar nerve running right through that groove and the elbow, both medial and lateral elbow are very busy place. And what she doesn't say is which motion is restricted. So if it's extension, that's scar tissue. She says here, um, had post um, sedated procedure to get the scar tissue in her elbow stretched out so she can fully extend it. So it was okay. obviously, she couldn't extend couldn't extend so that begs the question where's the problem right right so if you can't extend your elbow what's elbow. Stopping, what's stopping it it's the biceps tendon i was gonna say your flex your elbow it's, flexors it's so biceps. biceps yeah so what and elbow fractures happen in the back right right typically but this type of fall or procedure from my understanding is usually when you have an outstretched arm that fracture happens but if you look at the anatomy yeah biceps tendon doesn't get trashed no when because the the yes the, i see what you're saying yeah yeah yes, the, yes, yes. the bony architecture is posterior correct and the muscles that are so it can be in the joint capsule in the back yep. that the scar tissue would have formed. Mm -hmm. So the first thing to find out or feel with your fingers, because you're, unless you have the clinical authority to order the surgical notes, there's no way to know what they did. Right. That's the first thing. Um, sedated means that they used Versed, did not make an incision and just basically reefed on her arm to jam it. Now what that's going to do is annoy, injure the biceps tendon because you just stretched it and tore it some more. Right. And is your cerebellum going to let you extend your arm when the biceps tendon just got torn again. That's a heck no. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's that's the sort of language that the cerebellum uses and possibly even more colorful than that. <laughs> so, then I'd I'd look at the biceps tendon and even follow that up to the short and long head and the shoulder. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, in order to extend your arm, the triceps has to be able to contract but the biceps has to be able to let go and i'd go with torn and broken in 191 and 77 myself right. one of my other favorites post-operatively is using 49 and the nerve increase the vitality to the nerve 
Well, an 81. An 81 increases secretions. And I know everybody loves to think about 124 and 40, torn and broken and inflammation, but you also want to increase the vitality and the secretions to the area like that Absolutely. normally would go there so that they're not constricted. Um, there's, I have to pull it up and try to find it for you. And I did my frozen shoulder presentation a couple of years ago at the advanced, I came across this study about sedated frozen shoulder manipulation. That's a good face. Now I can say that to you. And there was a few um, practitioners that were on there saying that once we had the patient sedated, there was no restriction or once they went in to release it, there was nothing to release. It was in the UK. It, it kind of gave me the goosebumps to read it because yeah. it's that kind of validating. Perfect. Yeah. Kind of what we see as on this side of it uh, with our awake patients that the restrictions um, aren't as glued down. It isn't as um, scarred and adhered as we think that is, as opposed to a weakness or a wiring issue. Like you said, you're not it's going to. Yeah. It's neurological, not mechanical. Exactly. Is the cerebellum going to let you move your shoulder if, and if whatever. So if you sedate the patient and the shoulder moves perfectly yeah. and it's neurological yeah. and you let the sedation wear off and don't do anything because you're going to make it worse, but they have to get paid for doing something. So they have to do something. So they do something, but there we go. Right. Um, Exactly. So I'm glad we got to that question because that's an important one. And if it was on Facebook, we missed it. So thank you for emailing it to us because yes, it's an important um, one to ask. Okay. Moving right along. I do want to get to some of our new year stuff before we get in any further. Okay. So I love new year's. I love the beginning of everything. I love the beginning of the school year. I love the, I just love beginnings. It's the Scorpio in me, the yeah. Phoenix. Anyways, so this year, I want you to finish the sentence. This year, something I want more of is. Well, here's my thing with New Year's. Okay. You ready? Ready. All right. Every day is New Year's. You're right. Every, every day. Yes. So what do I want more of? every day well joy is a good one and that for me covers everything right so when people say well shouldn't you be retired or thank you for staying so late it's like or why would you see me on a saturday and it's like well what would i do that's more fun than this right so it's wow what would you do that's more fun than this right. so more joy joy is a good thing and I guess just understanding that everything happens the way it's supposed to happen, whether it's convenient for me or not. What's that phrase? God never gives you more than you can handle. And mm -hmm. then there's this tagline that says, God must think I'm a real badass. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like, thank you. <laughs> and it's it's so true, right? And now I'm going to add to that because something that you've kind of tagged along to that, that I think of is what can I learn from this? Yes. This is here to teach me something. What is it? That one. Um, so spot on. Those are, those are good things. So if you want more joy, what do you want less of? <laughs> wow. I don't even know. I guess I would like less of the puppy chewing up things. <laughs> that would be good. I we buy toys for her to chew on, and she the cats walk along the mantel and knock Christmas cards off, and the dog eats them. Well, eats parts of them and right. leaves them all over the family room. Yeah. Um, I don't know what I'd like less of. Every it's when if there is something okay this is my own mindset if there is something in your life that you don't prefer that is inconvenient or unpleasant 
my way, the way I have learned to, or been taught to think about it is it comes to you because you need it. It comes to you to teach you a lesson and it comes to you. And if you don't want it, change it. Hmm. So when things that are inconvenient is a really good word. I would love not to. Oh, my God. I got it. Sorry. I got an email last night from like I'm doing emails at 1130 at night. And I'm looking at the clock thinking I really have to get turn the computer off. Oh, I'll take this just one more. There is a woman in Poland that emailed us the contact at Frequency Specific. She has SPS. She has stiff person syndrome. And can FSM help it? And I said, well, funny, you should mention, I have that condition. And I have a feeling it's not as rare as everybody thinks it is. I think right. the testing for it is a thing. So it that condition is definitely inconvenient for me. Right. However, learning about it and how to approach it and how you work with convention because she wanted to be able to fix it with FSM. And I was like, well, I tried that for two years mm -hmm. until I couldn't, I couldn't sit here with FSM running eight hours a day with my pain level of seven. I just couldn't, couldn't get it done. So these are the medications I take. It's an autoimmune disease. So I had to fix my gut, get my vagus turned back on, which means we had to go after the mold yet once again. And so I can't even say I'd like less of it because it's a management problem. Right. If you can't get rid of it, you manage it. Yeah. And you put up with it until you can manage it. Hmm. Right? Right. So what am I going to do? It's like, well, okay, if I need a cane, I need a cane. The good news is one year into it, well, three years into it, in the last, I don't, I don't use a cane anymore. Right. right. And the medication, I don't take that every six hours anymore. I take it every four. Right. And when this pain shows up, I look at the clock and think it's five and a half hours. It's on you. So right. I would love to have fewer learning experiences, but apparently that is not what I'm on the planet for. So, <laughs> so what do you want more of? Time, <laughs> time in the day. <laughs> yes, yes. I um, want not be one o'clock in the morning when I'm finishing emails. Yeah, you shouldn't be doing that. I I started to set um, alarms last year, like just throughout the day, so I can just stay on track. Like time to pick up my kids, time to leave the clinic, time to chart, time to, and it's it's crazy that my phone is binging all the time or my watch is vibrating but it helps me. You were talking about last time you have the mom hat and the Dr. Carol hat and you, you do, you've got, we all have different hats and to stay in the right hat, I need timers. So I set a timer a couple months ago about no more um, Facebook, no more social media, no more emails, no more computer after 7 p.m. Right. right. My brain doesn't work after 7 p.m. Oh. at all. Oh, in Ayurvedic medicine, I'm what they call a pitta. Okay. So my high times, high productive times are from 10 in the morning till two in the afternoon and 10 at night until two in the morning. Well, that's how I got through chiropractic college. I put my kids to bed. I had a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. Yeah. I put my kids to bed at 8.30, 9 o'clock. Uh, and that's when I was able to start studying. So I would study from nine until one and go to bed at one, wake up at seven, get the kids to school by eight. I was never, I was famous for four or five, well, five years of chiropractic college. I never was on time to my eight o'clock class. And I told the teacher, I'm not being rude. Just don't expect it. And we're all going to get along fine. <laughs> um, it's just not compatible with my life, but that's, but that is when I had an Ayurvedic practitioner do 
my whatever analysis yeah that's and and for me if i don't turn everything off by nine o'clock if i'm not in bed by 9 30 it's game over the next time i look at the clock it's quarter to one wow yeah it just yeah so good for you i i you you inspire me as always just trying to stay stay on on task and stay present so that's yeah. my other thing um if i had to ask for less it's less worrying about the future and thinking about the past trying to i think that's a lot of people we're just trying to stay in the moment trying to stay here and that's yeah. why i love working in the clinic because it forces you to be and riding horses and training dogs yes. you have to be in the minute in the moment present um so that's what i love about that stuff you ever had a conversation with um a zen monk no it is unnerving at first but i had the good opportunity of being in the company of those kinds of folks for about four or five years and the most unnerving thing is the way they make eye contact and when they converse with you the whole rest of the entire world disappears and it is when i when i treat the other place that happens is in the clinic right because yeah. you you have your brain is at the end of your fingers yeah and for me the other place that happens is when i'm lecturing right because you're in person it's easier because you're totally focused on the class and everyone at the advanced even every one of 150 faces is you have to be present with them yes you can tell right totally even when you're treating and your brain wanders it shows up in your in your treatment you know um there's a couple of times i was having a conversation with a patient and i have to just stop and they said well what happened what's wrong what did you find what is it i'm like shh i'm having a conversation with your hamstring right now just like <laughs> love it what? Yeah. I'm like, I can't, yeah. I can't talk and press buttons and do this. So just give me a second. And I, I, I do have to kind of have that laser focus and think, and sometimes that smush is obvious and the range of motion is obvious and the pain goes down and it's obvious, but sometimes it's subtle and you have to be connected and there it is. And for me, yes, all of that. And there's a separate track because it's never the hamstrings. <laughs> no. There's it's never the hamstring. No. So what is the connection between the hamstring and this ligament that isn't healing? If it's just the ligament, then it heals. Right. If it's not healed after two years, it's because there's something else. Yeah. And that goes from the toes to the brain right and you yeah it, it's it reminds me of a patient that I had I wasn't taking new patients for a little while but it was a uh, a friend of a patient that I really like so is there any way you can see him he's in a ton of pain I said okay put him in the beginning or the end of my day kind of like you like thank you so much for getting me and I'm like this is what can I do that's more fun? Exactly. Like this is my, this is my thing. So, um, 68 year old patient had some pain in his neck, but the pain and numbness is in his forearm. I'm like, okay. So I start going up to his neck. He's like, no, 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 no. It was in my neck a couple of days ago, but it's my arm. You have to help my arm. I put my hand on his shoulders and I looked him in the eye, kind of like your Zen monk. And I said, I hear what you're saying, but it's not your arm. It's your neck. He's like, are you sure? I'm like, I am a hundred percent sure. So and that's when you get out the pinwheel and show them. I did. And it was surprisingly, he only had a bit of numbness, but again, he didn't believe me that it was coming from his neck. So 
um, treated the disc, treated the cord. He's like, oh, isn't that funny? I'm like, what? My arm, my arm pain's getting better. I'm like, imagine my surprise. Right. So I, um, I gave him a, I couldn't get him in, um, as much as I wanted to, but I gave him a custom care to take home for a couple of days. Um, and he had a video call with his primary care provider, um, after he saw me and I said, you might want to get some x-rays just to see what's going on in your neck. You can ask for that. And he texted me after and said, well, they don't want to do that. They just said, I don't need x-rays in my arm. I go, you don't need x-rays in your arm. You need x-rays up here. This is what we need to see. <sighs> Deep breath later, um, showing all the obvious things that we would expect to see in somebody who is 68. But sometimes um, for the practitioners out there listening, sometimes them reading that they have issues in their neck can help relay the information that it's not their arm. It is all coming from their neck. And this person's very active. So it's easy to, you know, he can do extension exercises later and all the things, but at least it's making the connection. Um, I had uh, the occasion this week to mention to somebody that I used to be an independent medical examiner. Okay. So I did it back when I was seeing a lot of auto accident patients. And I was the first time ever that the American Board of Independent Medical Examiners allowed chiropractors to take the same course and the same certification exam that MDs take. Hmm. So it's the same training. Yeah. And what I found out was that it's all about documentation. Hmm. The way to get that patient to get his GP to do an MRI of his neck because an X-ray is not going to show what you want. Mm -hmm. You start with reflexes at all five levels. So the lady today, her knee reflexes were very hyper reflexic with crossing on both sides. Mm -hmm. Her right-sided upper extremity reflexes were all plus two normal. Her left-sided were biceps was normal, brachial radialis was a plus two, triceps was completely absent on the left, like mm -hmm. gone. Mm -hmm. Clench your teeth, reinforced, gone, zero. Wow. If I'd done a sensory exam, so then what you do is you, and you do range of motion, that's fine. You send the patient with a note ask your MD because of these findings, abnormal plus three reflexes, both patella, you'd be amazed at the number of MDs who do not know that a plus three reflex in the patella is abnormal. And a plus one, plus two, a normal Achilles reflex in a 68 year old is abnormal. The Achilles reflex disappears in a 60 year old. That's normal. It goes to a plus one. And by the time you're 70, I don't have an Achilles reflex. No 70 year old should have an Achilles reflex unless they have a disc bulge pussing on their neck someplace in the cervical or thoracic spine. Right. So that was taught in geriatrics class. So if I see a plus two or a plus three reflex in a 68 year old at the knees, big flashing red lights. Mm -hmm. And that's because somebody in my geriatrics class and neuro class in chiropractic college gave me that factoid. Mm -hmm. Upper reflexes are retained with age. They go from a plus two to a plus one, but they're there. Right. So this patient today, if I wanted an MRI of her neck, you send a note with the patient giving them facts reflexes, sensation, these are abnormal. It indicates that the patient has a C6, 7 or C7, T1 disc bulge, non-surgical most likely, mm -hmm. in the neck. Would you please consider ordering an MRI? So when you're a chiropractor or a massage therapist or a physical therapist, you approach the primary care physician with respect 
and you said, would you, con- based on these, would you consider? Right. Then if the primary care refuses, you have the patient wait four weeks and you do conservative therapy. And then if it's still problematic or you end up with acute on chronic, acute on chronic, then you redo the physical exam and you send the note and you tell the patient, and this is the part where it really depends on the patient's chutzpah. And you tell the patient, I, I understand that MRIs are expensive and you don't want to order one, but I'd really like it if you document in the chart that I asked for one and that it was refused. I, know, I understand you have very good reasons for doing it and I respect that, but I really just, in case something happens down the road, I just, I'd like it documented in the chart that I asked for one and for what, you're completely right, I'm sure, but that it was, that request was declined. Immediately, if the, if the primary care physician has a brain in his head, he goes to the last risk management newsletter he got from his malpractice insurance company. And he says, well, all right, if it's that important to you, I think your chiropractor's crazy, but it's, it's an MRI. It's not going to hurt. It's not like we're taking you to a neurosurgeon. So isn't that a great line? That's fantastic. That is, um, it's like reverse psychology and playing to their ego and all the things and getting your way um, all at the same time. Well, and it back in the day, 98, 99, when I was the new chiropractor on the block, I had a patient with um, non-mechanical low back pain. And her MD had her on, just take Tylenol 3, just, just take some Percocet, yeah. And it was a month. Been forward, no change. Been back, no change. Something's not right. So I sent her with a note, would you please consider a lumbar MRI? And she came back and said, no. He said, no, just keep taking your Tylenol 3. That's It's just low back pain. So I sent him a letter on my letterhead and said, well, the patient is a 74 year old female with an intact uterus, intact ovary, a family history of cardiovascular disease. And my end, her pain is non-mechanical. And my malpractice position would be more secure if we had appropriate imaging to rule out ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, and aortic aneurysm. And those are the three possibilities that came to mind. So I sent him that letter and I gave the letter to, and I copied the patient on it, gave the letter to the patient to take to him and I mailed it to him. She said, he, she came back four weeks later and she said, you just saved my life. I have lymphoma. So it wasn't any of the three things I thought of, right. but I knew it wasn't inside my scope. This is not mechanical. Right. So it's getting them. And that's how you manipulate the medical system the way it is. They've been taught not to order imaging that they don't want to order it because our job, their job has become to save. um, Good luck with the barking. Um, Their job has become the to save insurance companies money. And it's like, it's not that they decline patient care. It's that they've been taught to order um, tests with a high, what's the word? Um, Recovery, right? That's gonna show you something really serious. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So that's where I learned that trick was on that patient. And I had another one with colon cancer, same wow. trick. Wow. She lost, so she comes in and she's got low back pain. And I check her low back, it's like, not a thing. And I said, wow, you're looking great. 
You lost what, 20 pounds since the last time? Yeah, 20 pounds in three months. Really? You've been dieting? No. Nope. And your low back pain? Mm. So I checked trigger points in her abdomen. She had them. And she'd lost 20 pounds and she had non-mechanical low back pain. I said, you need to go back to your MD. And once again, send her with a note. Yeah. So. Yeah, and again, that's, that's mileage, right? For you that, you know, you're, you know, but I think anybody, again, it's, it's a little bit of that. I don't want to say common sense, but reasonable expectation. If it doesn't add up, it's, there's something going on. It's not adding up for a reason. And well, and the other thing I have working in my favor is I was pharmaceutical salesman for 16 years and my doctors taught me medicine from their perspective. Right. And I was the only female pharmaceutical rep. I was one of three in the country in 1971. Wow. So these guys, I was 25, 26 in a size five or seven. So I was this cute little girl back when mini skirts with, you know, business jackets was a thing and I had great legs. So it was, it was easy. And they educated me. I saw medicine from their perspective because I was hanging in their offices, watching what their lives were like. Mm. And they don't mean to be dismissive or superficial. They don't mean to be. Right. but these days they they get dinged if they spend more than six minutes with the patient yeah and i've got 60 i'm gonna find more because i can do more mm -hmm. and it's my job to help them help right. the person right right that that brings me to uh i'm not sure if the two of us were copied on it from our uh, ask a question part, but somebody was asking about if we have a device or if we endorse the device or if we're working on a device that would be diagnostic. And my way, right before I could read your response, I'd be like, why the heck would we want that? That would just ruin my day. <laughs> like, where, where's the fun in that? And I get what you're saying. It'd be nice to know, maybe, I guess, if it was working, but we know it, it works. So nah, I, don't, nah. I don't need a flashing buzzer to say this is work. Like, this is why we have diagnostic skills. And I think that's the cool part about having the community that we do because we have so many practitioners trained in so many different scopes and we're all getting the same results with the same frequencies. So, and the biggest thing and I had the same email from probably the same person because yeah. everybody wants thinking your way through these things and taking the risk to be right or be wrong and having it be on you. That's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you have my compassion and <clears throat> I've never, ever encountered any diagnostic gadget and there i've seen many of them i've seen some that get pieces of it right here take these bok flower remedies it's like who knew but you're exactly correct and that does not fix my neck pain thank you very much or my elbow pain okay. what they don't understand is that every diagnostic device essentially electronically the only thing it can measure is a galvanic skin response, mm. right? That's, that's all it can feel is the electricity or the field that comes through your fingers, mm -hmm. all right? So but then they have to take it behind that. And if that's the output that this gadget is me measuring, some person, had to look at that output through their lens and interpret or say what that output means. So I, I've, there's one out there that I, these people actually believe it. And I'm, 
I have to be respectful, but excuse me. It measures your quantum field. And the thing is, you know, that big. Do they know what it takes to measure a quantum field? Have you been to Fermi Labs or in Chicago or have you been to CERN? And no, you don't do it with a gadget that you reach out. No. So every diagnostic gadget has been programmed by a person to interpret this output to have a meaning. Right. And that person, who knew he, number one, who knows who he was? Number two, why would you think he's correct? And number three, the most important and accurate diagnostic tool is in between your ears. Yes. Train this mm -hmm. and be brave. Yes. Be brave. Yeah. I, you can do this. I, every one of everybody listening, everybody who will ever listen to this has experiences that they bring to it that make them better on a day-to-day -day basis. There is no such thing as failure. Right. It's a learning experience. Yeah. It's like, well, that didn't work. Yeah. Or five years later, you want to go back and call everybody you saw in 19, you know, 2018 and say, oops, I, I learned this thing. Yes. So the lady that I saw today that's had three concussions. Yeah. Is it a surprise to you that her digestion is off no. and swallowing gets funky sometimes? And she has a tendency towards digestive difficulties and inflammatory responses. It's like, yeah, it's the vagus. Yeah. Now you tell me what diagnostic gadget with a cute little touch screen is going to tell you that. Right. Mm -mm. No, I mean, I can't think of any time in my life where work has brought me so much joy and has brought me to my knees in frustration all within the same hour. Humility. Right. So flexibility. Yeah. Don't get attached to the hypothesis. Like this is, I am so grateful for the, the life lessons that this modality has brought to us. So to just punch a button and go just doesn't, um, just doesn't do it. And I'm so glad that we've evolved the way that we're teaching people so that it's not just here's a program and go. Yeah. You can't, you could do that. And I mean, we have the ability now to program the custom cares so that patients can do that. But I think for the practitioners, that's yeah, what you're what you're able to create is that's where the magic is. It is. And I have to say, with all compassion and understanding and you do you i don't fsm doesn't suit everybody right because if you're the sort of person who doesn't want to take responsibility or be challenged to learn or make choices or be flexible if you're not that sort of person we're not your thing yeah go go use the blinky light gadget, go, go use the diagnostic gadget. You, you do you, mm -hmm. you don't belong here. Yeah. That's we're not your tribe. No. And I'm very happy with the tribe we have. We I have 4,000 practitioners in 23 countries. It's amazing. That's totally amazing. And the stories we get back. I know. Are so cool. So cool. Speaking of stories, I want to get to a couple Q and A's before we get to some other things. Okay. Um, Leaf, I guy here says Kim needs to have her beautiful new glasses adjusted. You're right; they are slipping down my face. Um, so thank you. I will get them adjusted. But the problem is that the plastic frames don't have the little silicon feet. No. Make them fit. Yeah. So my new prescriptive sunglasses do. Um, and living in California, I get to wear those all the time. So but you're right. Thank you. Thank you, Leaf. Thank you, Leaf. Um, Nancy, 
Uh, we have an established patient who is a hundred percent believer of FSM. Yay. We've treated her active shingles and skin rashes with great success. She has a uterine cervix polyps pending biopsy and asked for FSM treatment. We don't know if the polyps is cancerous or not. So should we wait until biopsy result first? We don't treat cancer. Any thoughts? You don't have a biopsy result, so it's not cancer yet. So right. cancer and me cancer metastasis is always inflammatory. Hmm. So what did what do we say on that one slide that we repeat three or four times about cancer? You treat the concussion protocol, you treat emotional relax and balance, but because I can guarantee that a patient who's waiting for a biopsy is terrified. Mm -hmm. So you treat concussion, concussion in vague. Well, now you don't want to treat the vagus. So you treat concussion, you treat the emotions, you support the adrenals and treat the cervix for what causes cervical polyps. Well, usually it's viral, right? So you have HPV. Mm -hmm. You have other viruses and it's inflammatory. So get more on the history. Has she had an IUD? Has she had a DNC? Has she had vaginal delivery? Has she had multiple sex partners? Has she had um, any sort of STD? Right? Mm -hmm. So what, what is her cervical risk? You treat the cervix for that, and there, until you have a diagnosis of cancer, you can't hurt her. Mm -hmm. If the worst you can do is it's not going to help, and she'll have the biopsy, then it's cancer, then they'll do a hysterectomy, and then you clean up the mess later. So before it's cancer, You give it a try, especially in the cervix. That's just, that one's a no brainer. Right. Colon cancer is tricky. Pancreatic cancer is tricky. Um, but even then, you they're going to present with something you're supposed to treat. And when you can't treat it, you're more likely to be the one that diagnoses it. Mm -hmm. So with this, the cervical, Nancy, that's a really good question. That's how I would approach it. It's like, well, you don't have cancer yet. So a patient comes in and they have a lump in their breast. It's like, well, I can treat inflammation. Metastatic disease is always inflammatory. So you reduce the inflammation. You don't run 40 and 116. You do immune support. So the immune system will wake up and recognize the cancer and take it out. You run concussion. You treat the lump. And you tell the patient, go get a lumpectomy and get it biopsied and we'll see. Mm -hmm. Right? That's, that's the way I do it. Yeah. But yeah, okay. great, great question. I want to talk about the advanced. It's coming up. Oh, remind me. Okay. I'm, it's, I'm so excited. I just can't even tell you. No, I, well, I it blew up my entire diastasis recti presentation today i completely dismantled it and i'm so excited about doing it like i haven't been this excited about a presentation since i don't know what so maybe my frozen shoulder one is that it the is, 90 minute one or the three hour one i could <laughs> i could do it in three hours and i could do it in 30 minutes it's got like room to play and and all the things so it is so not a slam dunk there's so many it has all the goodness of FSM as far as taking out scar tissue and recruiting muscles and supporting the stable state and all the things. So um, it's super exciting. I, I want to just say to everybody too, the hotel blocks are um, ending in like two and a half weeks. So I believe we only have until January 21st to secure your hotel rooms for the advance. So if you haven't done so, Get your hotel rooms if you're coming to see us in person at the advanced. If you are attending the FSM sports courses, the first five people to 
show me their registration and book their hotel rooms are getting a free set of sports wraps. So you can email me at Kim at fsmsports365.com with your registration and I will get those sports wraps to you at the course because it's around the corner. It's next month. I have to tell you what just happened. Yes. Last week. Do it. Maybe it was two weeks ago. William Clearfield is the MD, the DO. Yeah. MD. Anyway, he's doing the endocrinologic effects of on of traumatic brain injuries. Yes. And he has so much material. So I gave him a 90 minute slot on Saturday. Now, usually what we do is they have a 90 minute slot. And then the next morning they do a three hour block with Bill, Dr. Clearfield, he, he started feeding me stuff and I am seeing results in patients that he's treating. And, and, uh, how would you feel about doing a three hour block on Friday? I don't wanna take you out of your practice. I booked you on Saturday because you know, it's, you've got to make a living on Friday. And he said, oh no, I'm, I'm good with that. So Clearfield is doing a three hour block Friday morning on a deep dive. And the stuff he's just thrown out that he's talking about doing, it's like, do I really have to lecture Friday morning? I could, you could, uh, we'll play a tape and I'll come, right? So he is doing the three hours. And then, um, and that is, I confess, that's opposite of Lord at the same time that Laura Chaikin is lecturing, but we don't have that many ophthalmologists or people that are allowed to treat the eye. Right. So I'm assuming that Lori's group is going to be smaller. Yeah. And what Clearfield has to offer is so huge. When you look at the fact that brain injury patients, executive function and judgment doesn't improve because you don't have enough growth hormone. I didn't know that until a head injury patient that's been an absolute train wreck all of a sudden started thinking before he walked off the cliff. He actually started developing executive function and judgment as he's getting supplement support that supports growth hormone. Amazing. I just, yeah. So exciting. And then we have um, Dr. Hartman who yes. survived, enthusiastically survived stage four pancreatic cancer by a brilliant combination of alternative and Western medicine. There's no reason not to take drugs. Get a grip people. You can't yeah. fix everything yeah. with FSM, right. but you use it as an adjunct, right? Yeah. There's your elect, John Resky. I'm so excited. So this OT, I have a patient that had a bad head injury and I went with him to OT to evaluate cognitive function and to see if he could drive again and all of that. And the OT that examined him and she did a brilliant job. I mentioned, it's like, can I send patients to you? And she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I, I have patients from out of town I have them schedule Dr. Resky before they see me. They see me, they see him Monday morning and me Monday. You know Dr. Resky? So it's like, ah. I'm so excited. And then David Musnick is taking on long COVID. Yeah. And yours, and I'm forgetting somebody, but I don't remember who it is. Anyway, whatever it is, if if you want to, and it's and Jay Shaw. Jay Shaw. Yeah. Jay Shaw. It's like yeah. amazing. And we can live stream Jay Shaw. Yeah. We can record him. We cannot sell the recordings. Yeah. Is the thing with Jay Shaw. Yeah. So if you pay for Jay Shaw's day and you can't come physically, are you petting your dog? I am. <laughs> it's five oh, o'clock. That's adorable. She, no. heard, she heard my alarm I, going I off. I can't see my clock. It is 5.02. It is. Yeah. No, it's, I'm so excited about the advanced and multitasking. That's the one thing I'd like a little bit less of coming up I, I because know. the clinic, my 
and the advanced. Yeah. It's like, I want to do it all. I know. I know. Day by day, bit by bit. We're, we're, how, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, groan. <laughs> um what an amazing first uh podcast of 2022 i just love this this is so great so much fun so um people who are um listening to us live you can watch the recording on youtube the videos are on frequencyspecific.com and you can listen to us wherever you listen to your podcast spotify and itunes um Frequency specific sports three or sorry FSM sports 365.com is where you can find me and again all the videos YouTube you could listen to us watch us all the things we should have like an outtakes or like a bloopers day that would be that, that would, would be, be really fun. fun that would be fun one of these days actually sometime soon uh we have a um a staff outing we have a field trip the FSM staff is going to go out to the clinic and I'll do a video tour. Actually, Kevin's better with the camera. So I'll have Kevin do the video tour of the clinic from the front door to the gym. And Oh yeah, that'd be great. And we'll just, we'll do a tour so you can see our new home. Yay. So once we do that, once I get the pictures on the wall and we get the um, video room set up, We'll be doing the podcast from Trotdale. I don't think I've told Kevin that yet. Is that the plan? Yes. Oh, good. Kevin's nodding. I'm not in trouble. Talking about being here on Fridays. Yeah, and we'll be here on Fridays. So, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Hugs to everybody. Um, We'll see you all same time next week. We'll be here. Love ya. Bye. Bye. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.